Should I just see us now? We're on. We should. <laughs> All right. Okay. One more minute. Okay, I think we can start. Uh, I hope everyone can see me, the quote of this year. So uh, just before we start, I want to say that today we have two wonderful speakers. Uh, we shared all the details with you in the newsletter. Um, we have Farid and Marius. Both of them are also mentors and a part of the Startup Wise Guys team. Startup Wise Guys being one of the most well-known accelerators within the region. So hopefully we'll have a lot of uh, nice uh, and uh, very, very useful tips and uh, lectures today. Also, a part of that, I just wanted to take a moment to remind you that next week we'll, we will not have a lecture. We will have a week uh, where we will offer you the chance to apply for office hours with the mentors and the speakers that we have, we have had previously and in the previous lectures. So please keep posted. Please be aware of our emails and uh, because we will share all the details and the calendars of the speaker's availability uh, in the upcoming days. Um, so please make sure you don't miss on that email. Also, a part of that, we want to uh, remind you that those who are participating in these lectures and those who have signed up are, are the ones who will get a chance to, to apply for the office hours. So make sure you uh, either watch them here <laughs> or um, request them from the Google Drive um, and so on. Okay, so I'll give uh, give the the floor, the digital floor, to Farid first, who will also briefly um, say a few things about himself, and then afterwards, uh, after each of the sessions, we'll have a Q and A with the with the speakers. So make sure that you ask questions. Um, please don't be shy. Uh, there's no stupid questions, and we are really here to help you and to help you understand and and uh, and grow faster. Okay, Farid, I'm giving the floor to you. Thanks a lot, uh, Lina. So, hey, everyone. I hope you guys can hear me and see me well. Um, this is the fun bit about doing it online, because if you can't, uh, there's not much I can do about it. But um, uh, firstly, great that you guys could all join us. So first things first, we're going to start this. I'm going to start sharing. Uh, I have a little, a little kind of a presentation that I'm hoping is going to be interesting and fun for you. Uh, but I need at least the first 15 minutes, I need you guys to, to interact with me as much as possible. And for that, you can use the Q&A session, the Q&A uh, chat. Is that the, the, would that work, Lina? Yeah, that would work, I think. You can use whatever chat you have access to. I'm going to ask you a few questions. And if you, if you can answer them, that's great. Uh, but it's basically like uh, we said, there's no, there's no wrong, uh, there's no wrong answer, and there's also no no stupid question either. So so you make sure you use it for that. Um, I'm gonna start sharing stuff now. And there we go. I think that should that should work quite well. Uh, I'll try and move this up here. Okay. So um, today I'm gonna and I, and, I, and you know somebody tell me if something is not working properly. Uh, but today I'm going to talk about um, uh, something that I call getting the, you know, getting the right start and other small things that you should know. Um, and I know I've, I've looked at some of the some of the concepts discussed with you last week and in the previous weeks, and I've tried to kind of count, bring to bring to stage some of the things that I think are really important. Um, if you're coming up with new ideas, if you're just about starting your company, if you're just about uh, thinking about starting your own company, or even if you've started your own company, and you're making sales, all of this stuff is pretty valid for that, right? So, so it's, it's valid for everybody. A little bit about me, my name is Farid. Uh, I sit over here in the center. Uh, basically, I'm, a, I'm an engineer. Uh, I work a lot on creativity and business. I, uh, uh, I was, I'm one of the managing directors of uh, Wise Guys Cyber, which is a cybersecurity, defense, and AI accelerator of startup Wise Guys. Um, and now I'm also the program director for that. Um, for that particular program, but I've been working in the for the last three years across 130 startups with Wise Guys um, 
uh, as a as a main accelerator. I also do a lot of innovation consulting. I have my own in, in, innovation consulting firm called Take Three Innovate. Uh, so I have a founder there as well, and I work with companies like Intel, Telefonica, Vodafone, uh, Singtel, and some of the uh, a few business schools. And uh, previously, I had a startup within a company called Telefonica, which is the seventh largest telco in the world. And uh, we, our startup was saving about 100 million euros, 100 million uh, euros per year for this particular um, telco. And I also do a lot of work on design thinking. So I teach design thinking at uh, a couple of business schools. Uh, and the fun fact about me, I've survived five earthquakes. So now you guys know. Uh, and I talk to, uh, and I like to do a lot of workshops on what what I normally call the early stages of business, right up to right up to you raise a seed uh, a seed round. But basically, I call them deconstructing your business. So you're taking your business, you're pulling it apart like a Lego block, and you're putting it back together. So this is why I think uh, some of these concepts are quite uh, quite important, and we're gonna go through that. So um, first thing I want to ask you guys, and you can use the Q and A chat for this. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the role of people. And this is really, really important because um, a, a lot of startups actually um, fail. And, and in, 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 the, in, in the later startup, you normally have what is called a clash of cultures or clash of people, um, or you have co-founder issues. And I really want you to understand like, what this role of, of people is going to be. So one of the objectives of today's talk is going to be talking about people, about product, about what you're building for and who you're building for, right? So can you, you know, this, this over here shows like what a typical business looks like, right? Uh, this is a, a, a theoretical graph. Like you have the infancy, which is the first part of the business. Uh, expansion, when you start scaling, when you start like replicating your business in different countries. And maturity is when you're like really making a lot of money. And, uh, you know, you're, 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 it's, it's what people say like the golden era of a, of a business, right? But what normally happens is if you reach maturity, you can either decline and die, which is happening a lot nowadays, or you can renew your business and start going up, right? Now, let's, let's, let's talk about the first part, infancy. This is when, the, when your product, project, your startup, whatever you want to call it, right? For all practical purposes, I'm going to call it a startup. The startup is just starting, right? I want you to tell me at infancy, what kind of people do you need in your, in your team? So if you can use, I want to try and open the chat. I want to move it to the side so it doesn't cover up. So can you guys tell me, any of you, what kind of people do you need in infancy of your company when you're just starting off the first year before you get product market fit? Okay, I'm going to try and wait for some answers. Um, and I'm hoping that somebody will answer fast. But if, if you, oh, there we go. You need mentors. Okay, Kate. Uh, so you need so you need people who can mentor, but from a from a from a team perspective, what kind of people do you ha need to have in your team? So let's say you're three people and you have a team of three. What kind of people do you need? What 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 is the makeup of these? Um, you need flexible people, maybe aggressive sales engineers, maybe you know for a SaaS type. Yes. So you need people who um, are not your regular. Uh, this is my job description, or you know I will do sales. You know, uh, this way kind of, you're right, Andres, as well. Anything else? Uh, strategic managers, architects, developers. Okay, great. So you're giving me, like, the names. Now tell me, like, what kind of characteristics do you have? When you're three people, you're working from a garage. You don't know where your next paycheck is coming. What kind of mentality do you need to have? And I really want you to put yourself into that position. Uh, motivated. Uh, you need somebody who's active. Okay, great. Um, and, and yeah, somebody who's uh, who's kind of going in and, and doing a go-getter, so to speak. Like, you know, you, you're you the one who kind of solves the problem and you get on with it. Um, somebody without a, uh, you know, a lot of people say somebody without a job title. So, you know, if you have to do sales, you're the guy. If you have to do uh, HR, you're the guy, right? So it's what we call like... Um, and a lot of people also say that you need creative people, people who think outside the box because you're building something, right? Bosniak and Jobs. Well, I don't know whether it's Bosniak and Jobs, but but okay, the pair of them, yes, the pair of them, you you might be you might be uh, uh, they were they were a complementary pair, let's say, to begin things, right? But but essentially, what you, the kind of people you need in infancy are the people who are going to be creative, who are going to uh, you know uh, build things. 
uh, hustle, uh, not build it perfectly, but start kind of get getting to the point where uh, you have something that, uh, you know, it can be hustled around, right? You, you, you're your team of three, team of four, right? So, so that's the kind of people you need in infancy. Now, let's, uh, let's go to the next stage of expansion. Well, what kind of people do you need? You need an expansion. Now, expansion is a stage where, you know, you have, you're the king of one country. So you're the king of Latvia and the king of, uh, let's say, you know, uh, Estonia. You, you, you own the market there. Now you're going to Germany, France, UK, um, the Czech Republic. You're like, you know, cut and pasting your, 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 your business to all these countries. What kind of people do you need? Like, uh, you know, obviously you're well funded now. You have money pouring in through the bank. What kind of people do you need? Any guesses? In expansion. Let's see if people can... Uh, this is a very interesting chat because it doesn't go according to... But um, I'm going to wait for some answers to come in. But usually what people tell me around this is uh, the, kind of, the kind of people we need marketing, strategic sales, promotion, good salespeople. So you need people who can sell. You need people who are consultants, who can like um, work really well with big spreadsheets, who, you know, who can execute, who can cut paste, you know, they're focused. You tell them like, okay, you're the guy doing procurement. You're the guy looking at this account. You're the guy looking at this account. You're looking at this vertical. You're looking at that vertical. You have people who are very good at um, doing a, you know, a, a very specialized space, specialized piece of work. Right? So this is what you, the kind of people you need in expansion, right? Now, uh, okay, yeah, specialization. Okay, you're right as well. Yes, uh, and of course, sales is a, is a huge is a huge push, right? Now let's go into maturity. This is maturity is like okay, now you're you know you're a company like SAP or something. You're mature. You've got a lot of accounts. What kind of people do you need in maturity? And here you, you know, you're not, you're not reinventing the wheel. You're basically managing relationships. You know, you, you need people who are, you know, who are calm. You're, you need people who can be, you know, build relationships really well. You need people who, um, who can kind of increase efficiency without, uh, you know, they, they can save money here and there, but they're not, they're, you're not going for like really big wins over here, right? So this is maturity. But the question I wanted to normally ask, and this is the kind of question I ask people, is that have you ever taken people who we mentioned in infancy and the people that are in expansion, and have you ever put them in a room together? So the kind of people that you need in infancy, the creatives, the people who are hustlers, the people who like to take risks, and then the people in expansion that you need, the ones who normally are you know, focused, specialists, this is the way to do it, this is how we're going to do it, this is a proven way of doing it and you put them in a room together. Have you ever figured out what happens when you put these two people together in the same room? Anybody guess what happens? Has anybody tried that? I'm pretty sure a few of you have, uh, have seen that happen, and if not, you probably know what happens when you, when you put this, you know, this group of people together. Um, let's see what happens. Uh -uh -uh. Okay, we've got some answers. Ah, great question. Never thought, never thought about it. Uh, and an amazing startup happens. So this is the thing. <laughs> Nine out of ten times that doesn't happen, because the the guys who do infancy and the guys who do expansion are completely opposite, right? So the guys who do infancy, they do infancy because they get a kick about solving a problem. The guys who do expansion, they get a kick about getting growth. And uh, you have conflicting interests, like Peter has said uh, as well in the chat. So, and, and this is why you have to be very, very aware of the kind of people that you have in your team uh, at a particular period of time. And I'm not here saying that if you have somebody in infancy who is good at execution, who specialized, you ask them to leave, but you need to be aware of this. And uh, I have seen a lot of failures, both in the startup space and, and more so in the corporate space, where the wrong kind of people, so people from infancy who are great at like building the startup, like I'm great at getting to a point where people love my, my problem has been solved and my product is loved by everyone. And now I don't, I mean, there are people who don't really want to be king of the world. They don't want to scale at 15 different countries. Now they want to build something else and they want to solve another problem. They get the kick out of that. They don't get the kick out of growth, right? And it's really important to understand the role of people that you have at various parts of, of your startup journey. And I like to show this because not many of us think about it. And uh, part of this, uh, this, this talk we're going to have today is going to also talk about how, how can you be aware 
of the people that are in your organization, that are in your startup, that are in your team, that are in your mentor group, that are in your customer group. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that, right? So, it's, so firstly, great job interacting here. Um, I, I'm sure uh, this has been tough for the crowd that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm always uh, encouraged when a Baltic crowd en engages with me. But, um, but yeah, so I really wanted you guys to be aware of it. So the takeaway from here is like you need different people who enjoy doing different things at different part of your, of your journey. This doesn't mean that if you have somebody who's good at one and not good at the other, you, you remove them from the team. You just have to understand what they really like doing and you need to somehow, um, somehow address it. So normally what happens is people who do infancy, once they get to expansion, they start doing, um, you know, they start doing another infancy job over here. They start doing another infancy job over here. The guys who like doing expansion, they continue moving from expansion to expansion, right? So, so this is, I think, the, the bit that I really wanted people to know. Okay, we're getting some stuff on, uh, on chat as well, right? There's tons of chats and Q&As on this. I really like it. Okay, so now we're going to just move a bit forward, right? So thanks a lot for your engagement. Um, so today, I'm, you know, I normally want to tell people, I used to start by saying, okay, how to build the right product. Then I wanted to kind of talk more about how do you build the right company. And then I want to now talk about how do you build a purposeful company? Because a lot of what we're talking about today is about the purpose of why you should be, why you're doing something. And this is something that you need to try at home. It's a small exercise. I normally do this in a workshop and we normally spend about 15 minutes doing it. But it's very important if you're, if you're thinking of starting something of your own and if you're already started something of your own and you're doing it with a team, make sure all of you, all of you, so you, your co-founders, the team that you have, your, you know, anybody who's any attached to your project does something like this. Um, and you basically kind of ask this question, why are you doing the startup, right? Why are you doing your particular startup? Uh, and you, you write it on a piece of paper and you get all your, all your team to write this. And then the second question you ask is like, what is your personal purpose in life? And both of these are very philosophical questions, but I've actually had startups where the co-founders have never known this about each other. They've never known about, you know, why, why do they want to exist? What brings them happiness and what's their purpose in life? And why is this important? We'll get to it slowly, right? So just give me a little bit of creative freedom here. So this is one exercise that you should definitely do, right? The purpose of this exercise, firstly, is for you to think and write down things, right? Uh, we all think we know why we're doing stuff, but we very rarely write it down. So writing down actually uh, puts a little bit of, um, let's say, uh, it, it puts things into a concrete black and white, right? And it makes you think about it. And this is one of the things that your brain is not designed to do. Your brain is not designed to uh, put feelings into, into, into black and white, right? So it kind of helps you get there. And the second thing, and the more, most important thing is for you to be aware of your team's purpose. So why are different people in your team there? Why do they exist? And this is really important because you might be as a CEO there to save the world from hunger, but your CTO might be there because he wants to build the best product, right? Or he might be there because he wants his kids to get inspired by the work he's doing. And by you kind of, you know, having your, your own purpose and your CTO having a purpose that aligns with his life, it doesn't mean that both of you need to have the same purpose. It just means that you have to be aware of his and he has to be aware of yours and you have to respect that. Because you're never going to get co-founders or, or team members that are going to be equal. You will always have people that play a part in the team. Some will play a part at the beginning, some will play a part in the middle, some will play, play a part at the end, some will obviously do a lot more work. And this, this, this is the fluidity that you need to have. So you need to be aware of it and you need to respect it. Because the next time you ask the CTO that he should work over the weekend to get a particular, you know, software version in, you realize that one of his purposes is to do something with his family or for his family and that he has a family, you might not. Right. So this is a very, it's a very key thing. And actually it's the number one thing that I do when I do the cyber program. This is the first workshop that we do with the startups is for them to understand why each of their co-founders and their team exist. Uh, and it's very powerful. Now I'm going to spend about four or five minutes on a particular video. This is uh, by a gentleman called Simon Sneck. If you, if you don't know about him, uh, that's fine. I would recommend pretty much every book he's written. This particular book is called Start With The Why. So this is not my content, but this is a little four minute talk that he did. And I really want you to kind of understand 
some of the co concepts that are kind of going to come up are based on this particular this particular uh, talk. So let's spend about four minutes uh, listening to this particular. <laughs> I call it the golden circle. Why, how, what? This little idea explains why some organizations and some leaders are able to inspire where others aren't. Let me define the terms really quickly. Every single person, every single organization on the planet knows what they do 100%. Some know how they do it, whether you call it your differentiating value proposition or your proprietary process or your USP, but very, very few people or organizations know why they do what they do. And by why, I don't mean to make a profit. That's a result. It's always a result. By why, I mean what's your purpose, what's your cause, what's your belief? Why does your organization exist? Why do you get out of bed in the morning? And why should any... One care. Well, as a result, the way we think, the way we act, the way we communicate is from the outside in. It's obvious. We go from the clearest thing to the fuzziest thing. But the inspired leaders and the inspire or inspired organizations, regardless of their size, regardless of their industry, all think, act, and communicate from the inside out. Let me give you an example. I use Apple because they're easy to understand and everybody gets it. If Apple were like everyone else, a marketing message from them might sound like this. We make great computers. They're beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. Want to buy one? Meh. And that's how most of us communicate. That's how most marketing is done, that's how most sales is done, and that's how most of us communicate interpersonally. We say what we do, we say how we're different or how we're better, and we expect some sort of behavior, a purchase, a vote, something like that. Here's our new law firm. Uh, we have the best lawyers with the biggest clients. We have, you know, we always perform for our clients, do business with us. Here's our new car. It gets great gas mileage, it has, you know, leather seats, buy our car. But it's uninspiring. Here's how Apple actually communicates. Everything we do, we believe in challenging the status quo. We believe in thinking differently. The way we challenge the status quo is by making our products beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. We just happen to make great computers. Want to buy one? Totally different, right? You're ready to buy a computer from me. All I did was reverse the order of the information. What it proves to us is that people don't buy what you do, people buy why you do it. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. This explains why every single person in this room is perfectly comfortable buying a computer from Apple. But we're also perfectly comfortable buying an MP3 player from Apple, or a phone from Apple, or a DVR from Apple. But as I said before, Apple's just a computer company. There's nothing that distinguishes them structurally from any of their competitors. Their competitors are all equally qualified to make all of these products. In fact, they tried. A few years ago, Gateway came out with flat screen TVs. They're eminently qualified to make flat screen TVs. They've been making flat screen monitors for years. Nobody bought one. And Dell. Dell came out with MP3 players and PDAs. And they make great quality products, and they can make perfectly well-designed products, and nobody bought one. In fact, talking about it now, we can't even imagine buying an MP3 player from Dell. Why would you buy an MP3 player from a computer company? But we do it every day. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. When we communicate from the outside in, yes, people can understand vast amounts of complicated information like features and benefits and facts and figures. It just doesn't drive behavior. When we communicate from the inside out, we're talking directly to the part of the brain that controls behavior, and then we allow people to rationalize it with the tangible things we say and do. This is where gut decisions come from. You know, sometimes you can give somebody all the facts and your figures, and they say, I know what all the facts and details say, but it just doesn't feel right. 
Why would we use that verb? It doesn't feel right, because the part of the brain that controls decision making doesn't control language. And the best we can muster up is, I don't know, it just doesn't feel right. Or sometimes you say you're leading with your heart or you're leading with your soul. Well, I hate to break it to you, those aren't other body parts controlling your behavior. It's all happening here in your limbic brain, the part of the brain that controls decision making and not language. But if you don't know why you do what you do, and people respond to why you do what you do, then how will anybody how will you ever get people to, 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 to vote for you or buy something from you, or more importantly, be loyal? So I hope, uh, I hope that, that made some sense. But I mean, basically what he's trying to say there is people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it, right? Uh, and this is really important. And you know, the, the reason it's important is going forward in your journey of building a startup, everything from, like I mentioned, you have your, your team members, your co-founders, you need to understand why they're in this. But at the same time, you, you can use this, you can use your purpose, your calling, the calling of your, of your startup to, to hire people, to get customers, to, um, you know, to get investors. And, and these are things that sometimes uh, are one of the most overlooked things. And you might show them all the statistics in the world, but if they don't really get as to why you're doing it, and this is very true in, in, you know, in both when you're looking for investors and when you're looking for business partners, um, unless they're in it for a transaction, They'll never align with uh, with you as an organization, and um, I mean, I would re de definitely recommend reading the whole book uh, by Simon Sinek. He, he has a few of them, but to start with the why is a really a really interesting one, and really kind of turn the message on starting with like, you know, why do you do? Why are you doing this? How are you going to do this? And what are you doing? So if I ask somebody like, hey, so what do you guys do? And they tell me, well, we're building a um, e-commerce platform to connect pet owners with I don't know. Uh, with, with pet sitters. Uh, instead of starting that, they say, hey, you know, we see that we believe that every pet should have, uh, uh, you know, a, a decent lifestyle and people are, you know, people go on vacation and they, need, they love it that their pets stay with, with people that, uh, that would love to take care of them. And we did this by connecting them together and building a marketplace. It's called this, and it's a B2B SaaS uh, or, you know, a C2C consumer to consumer um, marketplace or whatever it is, right? So it's a, it's a very different way of, of framing what you're doing, right? And the first thing, the only thing I remember this conversation is that we believe that every pet should have a life, you know, with a, with a loving caretaker, right? And if I'm aligned with that, I don't care what you do. I don't care how you do it. I just want to, I want to be a part of it, right? So it's really important to, to focus on why you're doing this and be able to be able to kind of vocalize it and, and tell it as it is. And this is actually a very interesting uh, thing as well. I mean, we, we often hear of things like design thinking, lean product development, agile methodology. And if you actually was to put, um, put these things into, into the why, how, what uh, kind of principle, you realize that design thinking gives you the, the reason that you, you kind of understand what the problem is. Why should you be solving this uh, particular issue? How you solve this is the ideation, is when you figure out what the idea is to solve this particular problem. And what is the actual product or the gadget or the widget or the app or the marketplace or whatever you're building, right? So, and that's normally built using a guy methodology. So all of these things kind of really fit in really well. I'm not gonna spend too much time on like talking about the MVP and stuff like that, but just to, for you to understand that, you know, if you, if you understand why you're doing this and how you're gonna do it, you get a better understanding of what it should look like, right? You'll be more successful in it. Um, this is a very interesting concept and I really want you, really want to kind of bring this along because once you've decided like, you know, uh, you know, why you're doing this, then I really want you to focus on like, what are you creating? Uh, and, uh, and a good example of this is something called as the experience economy, right? So a commodity, a commodity is something like uh, electricity or water, right? So you have your electrical supplier and you, you pay them a certain amount of money. That's a commodity, right? To, to kind of give it a good, good example, I'm going to say um, coffee beans. Let's take an example of coffee beans, right? You take coffee beans. Uh, you get on a plane, go to Brazil, you go to a coffee farm and you say, I'm going to buy 10 kilos of coffee, right? And the guy's going to say, hey, 10 kilos of coffee in a bag are, you know, five euros. So you get 10 kilos of coffee, you pay him five zeros. There's another farm in the farm. The next farm says, hey, I can give you the coffee for 4.99. And you're like, okay. There's a farm next to it that says, I can give it to you for four euros and 95 cents for 10 kilos. Okay. You kind of, you know, you're, you're basically working on cents over here, right? So you pick the cheapest deal. You take the coffee bean bag and you get on a plane and you come back to Latvia, right? 
That's a commodity. You just now trade it in a commodity, right? Now you take that coffee, you grind it, you put it in a little bag, and you sell it in the shop. So if you go to Rimi, there's you know different kinds of coffees, and then there's your coffee over there, and you're selling I don't know, uh, one kilo over there for five euros, right? So you've converted the the commodity into a product by putting packaging on it, by putting labeling on it, by making it available to a consumer through a, through a channel, right? So you can go buy it. And that's a product. Uh, but again, you're sitting on a shelf with 15 other products, right? You have all the Italian products, you have all the rocket bean roasted products, everything is all there and you're competing with that. Let's assume that somebody buys your product, right? And you go to now a, a, a restaurant, you know, have lunch there, and then you say, oh, I'm going to have a coffee, can I have an espresso? And then over there, you're paying, what, two euro, two euro fifty for an espresso, which normally has about six grams or 10, 12 grams coffee right and you will and so here what we're going from is paying five euros for 10 kgs to paying two euro 50 for 12 grams right and you might say oh for but you're paying for the service for the waiter for the table yes i know and that's why it's a service right and you're paying more for it but then i give an example and this example doesn't work that much in the baltic but uh let's assume you go to the equivalent of you know starbucks um, caffeine, uh, you know, whatever it is, you go to a specialty coffee shop, right? So if, I mean, I'm going to just go with Starbucks purely because I think pretty much a lot of people have experienced Starbucks, right? You go into Starbucks, you get the same coffee and this is, you know, for Starbucks for caffeine, it's, uh, it's exactly the same. Uh, you know, you get the same coffee that you would get anywhere in the world in all the Starbucks or all on, on all the caffeine, right? In Starbucks, you even get the smell. The first thing you get into the shop in a caffeine or Starbucks, you smell coffee. The guy also in, in a Starbucks knows your name. If you go there twice, he'll always be like, hey, Matt, how is your flat white? Another flat white for you today? And that's the experience that you get, right? And you have to understand that these experiences are created. You're paying close to like five euros, six euros for the same amount of 12 to 14 grams of coffee, right? But the experience is being created for you. And this is what I kind of tell a lot of people who are keen to build startups is that you need to be working on um, services and experiences because this is where the unicorn is great. If you look at anything that's a unicorn right now, they have taken some part of an existing journey and created an experience around it. So you look at Uber, look at Bolt, look at Airbnb, look at eBay, everything. eBay always had marketplaces. There was always a, a, an online way of doing shopping, but eBay kind of created an experience in buying secondhand stuff. Right? The same thing, there were always taxi apps. There was a taxi app to hail a taxi, uh, but the experience that, let's say, an Uber or Bolt created is completely different because you know, Bolt basically lets me, as a non-Estonian or non-Lithuanian speaker, go to Lithuania or Estonia or Latvia, get in a taxi, not speak the language, and if I'm coming from the US, not even have any euros, uh, and be able to sh you know, write the address in my phone in Spanish, and, and the person in you know, the taxi driver gets their address in Russian or in Latvian or in Lithuanian in their language so they can understand it. That's experience. So when I ask people, what does Bolt do? And they say, it's a, ta it's a taxi hailing company. It's not. It's an experience for you to get from point A to point B. And that's important, right? And the future of, 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 of everything we were doing in products and commodities becoming services and experiences this was actually a study done in 1996, right? So even before the internet became mainstream, people were talking about how we should be focusing on experiences. Um, and the same gentlemen who were focusing on experiences now have come up with, they've extended their, um, their, their, their research. And what they're saying is the next thing is gonna be experiences, but in a socialized, personalized way. And a good example is if you look at, let's say TripAdvisor now, um, your friend or your friend's friend's recommendations or reviews come up first, right? Um, and you're able to kind of do a lot of sharing through social media. There's a lot of, uh, you know, if you recommend friends, you get a certain number of codes. And so what I'm trying to tell you right now is that try and focus on stuff like this. Try and focus on building experiences. And this experience doesn't have to be the end experience. It can be the experience of purchase. It can be the experience of, um, you know, for, so think of both and think of the experience of the taxi driver. The taxi driver doesn't have to deal with people not paying. He doesn't have to deal with people uh, throwing up in his taxi. 
you don't have to deal with not having enough people because both will actually tell him where to go and where to pick up passengers from. You don't have to deal with not knowing the language, people not having money to pay him. And that's his experience, right? His experience has improved so much more than what we can imagine as consumers, right? So I think this is really important. And I really want you to understand that you, know, you have to be focusing on the experience and not on the product. And so when I talk about product going forward, I talk about the, you know, think of it as experience, the whole end to end. And I think that's really important, right? So you need to really kind of move up the ladder and not focus on commodity because commodity, unless you're doing it at scale, is very difficult to make a lot of money on, right? Um, the experiences you can, I mean, this box shows how much uh, more you can charge for an experience versus, uh, you know, just the product. And you know, this is why Starbucks, people are standing at an airport in a queue for Starbucks when there are 15 other coffee shops selling cheaper coffee. So, you know, you have to really kind of understand the, the, the psychology behind it. The next concept, and this is quite important, and I'm going to spend about five minutes on this, is for you to understand where you are. And this is really important to really understand what you need to focus on. Okay, so if this is a time from zero to infinity, um, you could be at a point where you have no idea, no product. You're literally just, you know, thinking, I want to get into entrepreneurship. You have a concrete problem that you know that you want to solve, but you have no idea on how to solve it or no product. You have a concrete problem solving idea, but no product. So you kind of know exactly how you're going to solve it, right? Um, and, but you don't actually have a product for it. You have an MVP. An MVP is a minimum viable product. It is basically the, the smallest or the, the crudest thing, the, you know, the, the hustle thing that you can make, that you can sell, the smallest thing that you can sell to somebody um, and get money from them, right? So you're, so you're solving such a big problem for them that even though your product looks like it's been put together and it has like, you know, this doesn't work and that's going to be added a feature later on, people are willing to pay you money for it. That's an MVP. Or you have a full-on product that's launched. Or you have competition. So you've launched a product and there are other competing products that are doing something similar. So this is like the time trail of like where life goes for me. So it's infancy, you know, scalability and expansion, so to speak, right? And, but in a horizontal format. Um, so I want you to understand, like, if you have no idea or no product, what you should really be doing is inciting to find the problem, to find the opportunity where you want to get in. You, you know, what problem are you looking to solve and for who? And this is called inciting. And it's really important that you insight. You get insights from people that you want to solve problems for. Okay. And once you have a concrete problem, uh, so you say, okay, I, the problem I want to solve for you is um, getting people to work during the snow. Right. Now you need to figure out how you're going to solve it. Are you going to provide a taxi service? Are you going to provide a, you know, a tunnel? Are you going to give people umbrellas that save them from the snow? It's not a big problem in Riga, but for people like outsiders like me, I, I've never learned how to walk in snow, right? So I fall a lot. So, you know, I'm just giving an example. So the ideation is the idea thing is to find the idea to eliminate the problem, right? And this is something that is really important as well. And the reason I say this is because most startups actually, unfortunately, start, hold on, I'm move this. Uh, unfortunately, start from here. They, they, they instead of actually um, starting from finding an insight, they start with trying to, trying to find the idea, right? Oh, I have an amazing idea. And, and this is obviously a problem, right? If you now have a problem, so you know that I have an idea on how to solve this problem, then you have to find, an, you know, I have to build something that you can put together and sell, right? That's called iteration. That solves the problem. And if you've already done that and you have an MVP and you can see like the way this, this kind of goes, like if you don't have this, you do this. If you don't have this, you do this. If you don't have this, you do this. And then this is how you kind of go. Uh, and if you have an MVP, then what do you do if you have an MVP? You basically, you, you iterate, you make it so that it's, it's more usable, right? Um, and, and, and this is, you know, this is the journey. So you have to really understand where you are and what you do is, it depends on where you are. Um, and essentially what this means is that you have, at some point, you have a, a product that gets launched. Can I get this thing to come down? Here we go. You have a, a product that gets launched. Or, and you have a, com a competitor that launches as well, right? So at this time zone, you have these two things that happen. But in between this, um, what we call, uh, you, ha you have two spaces. Um, and one of them at this point is competitive. So basically, once you've launched and the competitor has launched something, you're going to be competing with them. 
But before you compete with them is what we call the creational space. This is called creational strategy. And it's also called blue ocean strategy because essentially at this point, you are creating value. And it's always um, beneficial for you to put all your effort in creating rather than in competing. And the reason for that is if you're competing, you're going to burn money. Only people with the deepest pockets are going to win in a competition, right? Because anybody can, you know, if you say I'm going to do it cheaper, then somebody's going to give it for free. And then if you say, hey, I'm going to uh, create a new taxi service to compete with Bolt and it's going to be cheaper, then Bolt will give it for free and we all know who has more money, right? So it's always important for you to focus on creating, for creating and solving problems rather than working on competition. And this is why you really need to be aware on how you're going to do this. So I hope that kind of makes some sense for you um, of why it's important to basically be working on the creational side, on focusing on, on, on actually identifying, solving a problem and, 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 uh, and identifying it. And this is like another way of doing it. I'm just going to quickly remove all the drawings. There you go. So this is exactly what we just saw in the previous, you know, you, you, you have to find insights. So you have to understand the problems that people are facing. And then once you find problems, you find ideas on how to solve them, but you have to check with them whether these actually solve the problems or not. And if they solve the problems, then you have to start building a smart prototype or an MVP. And then once you build this uh, prototype or MVP, MVP, you have to validate it with the same guys to make sure whether it actually works for them, right? So for the example of uh, helping people walk in snow, uh, to go to work, Maybe you don't have to build a service. Maybe you just build how a good software to work from home, right? And this is a, a, a pretty um, like an important thing to understand. So don't focus on the ideas. Focus on the opportunity or the problem. Because unless you understand this opportunity, you're never going to be make, you know, building something that people want to use. OK? Um, I'm going to actually skip the slide because uh, we don't have time for it. Um, but essentially what I also wanted to tell people on this one is try and be the guys who are trying to solve customer problems. Don't be the guys who are trying to change the customer behavior, right? Customer behavior is, hey, I'm going to build um, a new web browser that's going to be better than Google because it's going to be more private. Okay. So then your job is to first build a browser and then you have to convince people to change their behavior. Right. But if you said, I'm going to build a browser that doesn't have any ads. Right. And I'm going to focus it on people who are tired of ads coming into their uh, into the browsing experience. Or I'm going to build a browser where it's testing for gamers because ads slow down their game. Right. So you have a focus. And what you've done is you're adding privacy by removing the ads. But at the same time, you're solving a customer pain point. So it's much easier. You get more traction that way because you're focusing on a customer pain point. And this is what I wanted to show people over here, is that don't be the guys changing your customer behavior because customer behavior changes takes a lot of time. A good example of this is you know, when Apple removed the headphone jack, people were like, I'm never going to buy an Apple phone again. I just, you know, this is going to be the death of Apple, blah, blah, blah. And now nobody cares. People assume that it's fine, right? But that customer behavior change of using the seat type or using headsets, uh, it took one or two generations, right? And this this time, uh, it, it, and this takes time, right? So you got to be like very uh, aware of that. And like I mentioned to you before, uh, anything with time requires money. So unless you have a lot of money to change customer behavior, don't change customer behavior. Right? Um, final couple of slides. I want I know that you guys had a a, solu a problem a product market fit um, workshop, but I wanted to kind of really make you guys aware that before you get to product market fit, you have something called as problem solution fit. So I really want you to, to look at the fact that unless there's a problem that you're solving and you're solving effectively, uh, you're never going to get the prop to product market fit because the, the path to product market fit is problem solution fit, early traction, product market fit, and scale, right? So if you're not doing product problem solution fit and you're not getting early traction, you're never going to get product market fit. And lastly, and this is one of the, the concepts that kind of leads to this like early traction, what we call over here. So what do you mean by early traction phrase? It's basically this concept of who are you building things for? And a lot of times people say, I'm building this for, if I ask you like, who are you building this for? And you say, buddy, I'm building this for all the developers out there. You're never gonna sell it. 
because you need to build something very specifically for an early adopter, for people who really have that pain. So we then encourage them building this for independent developers, um, building particularly web, web applications, and they're building it in, in non-English languages. Okay, we've got it down. Now you're going to say, but in non-English language, I'm going to look at the Baltic languages first because it's my home market. Okay, great. And it's a way for them to regionalize absolutely fast. Fantastic. Okay, sure, in the end, it'll be for all the development houses and the Googles of the world. But right now, you need to really focus on the early adopter and then figure out what is the problem that you're solving for them. And one tool that's very, very useful for this is the Lean Canvas. So normally, I will follow this presentation, this workshop with a with a two-hour workshop on Lean Canvas because you actually get to understand, well, you know, who am I building this for? And a good example of this is Facebook. You know, Facebook wasn't built for you and me. It was built for, you know, Harvard students and then for students before universities. It, it had a very, very, uh, you know, focused what it was designed to do at the beginning and slowly and slowly they added more features and they added advertising. I mean, I still remember the time they had nothing in the news feed. You couldn't share news. You just had updates from people. Right. And I remember that time. So, you know, your, what you're building is very specific to solve a problem for somebody right now. But when you communicate things, when you communicate things externally, when you want to show the size of the market, when you want to sh show this vision, you have to then show, okay, who's this going to be really for in the future? Where, you know, where does scale come from? Okay. So I hope this has been useful. Uh, I want to leave you guys with this like one last thing. So if you're kind of building something, if you're looking to build something, try and see if you can put it into this kind of a format. And this is not like a golden standard of anything or anything like that. It's just a good way for you to understand that you, you understand what you're building. So remember, we started with why you need people, why you need to communicate, how you need to communicate. So the purpose, for putting the purpose into things and then coming to this point where um, now you need to kind of really figure out like, what are you building? So if you can build something, if you can write this down, like for, uh, or, you know, developers developing apps in the Baltics, web applications in the Baltics and non-English, my, uh, you know, API is a monthly subscription SaaS, which lets them regionalize their applications super fast. Unlike other applications that have, that take apps on a, on a app by app basis, and it's very difficult to do version control. Ours works directly with the source code. And every time the source code is updated, the app is updated simultaneously. And unlike um, you know, our competition, which do this either for really big developers, we target smaller developers because there are, I don't know, 15,000 developers in the region. Okay, okay. Now I get exactly what you're building, who you're building it for, what does it do, how is it different, and why is it different from the com from the competitor? Okay, so this is like a little bit of a, a cherry for you. I hope you guys have taken a screenshot of this, or this will be available to you later on anyway. Anyway, that's about it, guys. I have gone four minutes over time, but I will blame it on Lena because she took four minutes of my time. Uh, <laughs> and if you can ask some questions here, uh, feel free to ask them now or forever hold your hold your peace. Uh, yeah, thank you, Farid. Um, uh, yeah, if you have any questions, anyone, uh, please post in the Q&A. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, you mentioned that you usually have a workshop around Lean Canvas. Mm -hmm. Can you share a couple of uh, sentences about what that is or maybe any resources or links while we're maybe waiting for questions or not? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, the Lean Canvas is something I've used with pretty much all the startups. I, surprisingly, I've also used Lean Canvases with, uh, with, like I said, some of my innovation clients who are like who have revenues in like billions of dollars. Um, they actually write their whole business plan around, and it starts from a Lean Canvas. So they actually start with a Lean Canvas. They put all the details in a Lean Canvas, and then somebody actually writes a slightly more detailed report on it. But um, I would recommend you just Google Lean Canvas. You can find it from Strategizer if you want. Uh, my only three rules of a Lean Canvas are or we always do the Lean Canvas um, uh, for one customer segment. So if I'm asking you, you know, who you're, who you're building this product for, don't tell me uh, all developers and development agencies and even corporates who have develop in-house development. No. You've got to focus on one customer segment because they're going to have different problems than, let's say, the corporate, invest the corporate developers. 
to focus. You can't be like, I'm building this for tourists and residents, different markets. So three rules for Dean Canvas, make it for one customer segment, make it so that it's in the present. So think of it as if you're today, what are you building? What are the problems you're solving for the next three months? And the third thing is you always um, build the Lean Canvas as a living document. So a lot of our startups, what they do is they use the Lean Canvas as a way to build the whole, bring the whole team together and understand what problems they're solving for whom and why. And then what they do is they actually update that every quarter. Uh, you know, it takes about two hours to update it, but it also helps them kind of get more information and their assumptions change and their information changes and their insights change. It's a, it's a very powerful tool if you use it properly. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, we also have a question from Kata. I hope oh, I'm yeah. reading this right. Um, her question is uh, how to create a team at the stage of infancy? Right. So how do you create a team? So again, I, you know, creating a team is, um, is a very delicate process at any, at any point of time, right? So, uh, creating a team is like, you know, you have to, I always say like, what's in it for them? There's always like, what's in it for them? There's a, uh, you know, people have to align with you and what you're doing, right? And people get motivated by different things. So how do you work and get, get the team going in infancy? Firstly, if you have a great idea, you should be able to communicate it really well. So you have to get people to align with you because at, at infancy, you are the, you are the inspiration. And the vision that you have and the product that you want to build is what attracts people to you. And why you do it is the easiest way for them to align with you. In a more practical sense, hackathons are great places to kind of start finding people who might align with you. So you do hackathons. Essentially, in Wise Guys, what we do is we kind of uh, you know promote a lot of hackathons. From hackathons, you kind of have a little loose team that comes together. Uh, and then th that team kind of goes into like an online accelerator. You start validating the product. You kind of start speaking to mentors, when mentors become encouraging and you know how you take that feedback and how you pivot yourself, uh, suddenly would either give people encouragement, like, hey, this is worth it. Let's just give up everything and let's start doing this together. I'm in it, right? Uh, and this is why it's important to know their purpose because if suddenly you, 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 know, you meet somebody and they want to do this because they want to make a lot of money, you don't have money at infancy. So you need to really kind of understand this. It's a, it's, it's, it's more like an art rather than a science. Um, and it's very relationship building, right? Um, but practically, hackathons, meetups are great ways. But all I would try and tell you is that you have to really be able to communicate um, why people should join you, right? What your vision is. If you have a problem, if you are solving a problem, you have to communicate it. That I feel that this is wrong and I want to build something that solves this. I'm looking for a CTO, right? You get on stage and you say this, and you know, I'm looking for a CTO who's, you know, who has the same problem, who aligns with me, who wants to build a product that can you know, solve education or whatever. And you will actually find, we've had startups who've actually done that, who've managed to kind of align people with little or no money to work with them. It doesn't last long, so you have to be very prepared uh, how you're gonna move this to the next stage because lack of progress is the biggest demotivator. So if you don't make progress, if you're making promises and you're not moving forward and you know you are not committed, they're not going to be committed either. So. Okay. Yes. Uh, what other question? We have one more question. Is there a difference? Yeah. If there, is there a difference in the startup development process for a software app and hardware? Um, so hold on. I'm going to move this to the side. Basically, firstly, I'm going to before I answer that question. If you guys see this QR code, you can take a QR code photo use a QR code from a camera of a regular phone, and you can actually give me feedback on this on this talk that we've just had. So it helps me kind of build this talk better. Answering Federalis's question, is there a different development process? Um, as far as I have seen, no. The inciting, the ideating, and the iteration process remains exactly the same. What changes is um, the speed at which you can do it and the cost that it might take for you to do it, right? Because when you're starting to build hardware physical products, there's a huge barrier on cost. And this has come down a little bit with you because you can do a lot of 3D prototyping. You can also get a lot of design houses to build you prototypes on, you know, on computers. You can do a lot of simulation work if you're building very high tech stuff. And the last thing is you can actually fly, fly to China and you can actually build prototypes there and bring them back, right? And, uh, you know, the thing with, pro with, with hardware is you just need a lot more uh, capital expenditure, a lot more money at front to scale. 
right? It's not always a bad thing because there's a lot of funding available for it by the EU and some local governments, especially if you're doing something in medical or in um, sensors, IoT, stuff like that. There's a lot of money available. But the process, the startup development process doesn't change as much. You're still solving a problem. So if you think that, hey, I'm going to build this amazing hardware product that can, you know, uh, I don't know, be the home companion for a person. But if you don't really understand like that one need uh, that you can solve for that person with that companion, then you're just building something that's going to be like, a, you know, take two, three generations for people to start buying it. Right. And this is important. Um, and this is why, for example, if you look at any wrist, uh, you know, sports wrist bands that uh, kind of give you heart rate and stuff like that, they took a lot of time for people to use it. People just, you know, when people started buying them, they, they missed their watches. And they still miss their watches. So, you know, they, those, those bands never solved the problem. They were hardware, they were software. You know, nobody really cared about what my VO2 max was except for athletes. And these weren't, they weren't targeted towards athletes. These are these, uh, you know, the wristbands that, uh, what do you call it, sports utility bands, whatever you call them now. Right? So the process is the same. You just need to solve the problem. I cannot stress enough how important it is to make sure you're building something that somebody wants. If you don't do it, uh, then you're going to spend a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of heartache building something and then trying to squeeze it into somebody um, to use it. <laughs> uh, thanks. Uh, I also had a, just a curio curiosity question mm -hmm. uh, Yeah, um, about um, in your experience, is there a stage in a startup where it's... Um, viable or possible for the participants or the ones who are building um, building the company uh, for that for their goals and the the main aims of why they're here or building a startup if they don't align is there a scenario where this could work or a stage where of this could... I mean again I keep telling people like the idea of doing this exercise of, is to be aware of the purpose why everyone is there mm -hmm. and be aware of the fact that different things are the reasons why different people are there. And yeah. if, you, or if, you, if you understand that, and if you respect that, there is a way to move forward, right? And this is why, you know, the Steve, the Steve Jobs and Wozniak example that you mentioned was, it was a perfect example of that. Like people were in there for different reasons. And mm -hmm. while, this, like, while this did not work out in the long run, you know, the, the reason they were there was because they both respected what the outcome for this was gonna be in the short or medium term, right? Uh, and we have had, like, even in my current program, we've had two founders, you know, one is doing this very specifically to solve a problem he's so passionate to solve. And the other one is just happy to kind of build a product and, you know, take it to market because he believes that, uh, you know, this is what's going to bring him happiness. And this is his purpose to take technology and, and take it to people, right? Both of them have different purposes. Uh, they're not aligned per se, but they're complementary. And they both respect each other for that. And they actually never knew this unless until I actually asked them to vocalize it. And they actually had to say this in front of all the, the startups in the room. So definitely it's possible. But you no, know, startups are never going to be like 100% aligned. People's circumstances change. People's priorities change. So there's always going to be change. Uh, you, ha you just have to be like respectful of the fact that the people you're working for are the people that you trust. Right? So the people that you're working with, uh, you trust them, you trust their purpose, you trust why they're being there. Uh, and this is important, right? I would say. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Vard. Um, I, I don't see any other questions. So um, in, case, in case there are some, <laughs> we'll try and answer them in the chat for everyone else. But uh, for now, uh, we'll say a big thank you and, and give the floor to the next Marius. Thanks a lot. I'm going to stop sharing. Marius, you can go on. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Are we good with the sharing? Yep. All right. Hey, guys. Um, really good virtually to meet you i i know i don't see you that's why i was asking uh lena about who is on that side and 
and um, how the best to share my experience and so on. So uh, yeah, very happy that uh, you are here. I'm really glad that you hear that uh, really good uh, insights from Farid. So very quick about myself and why I'm here and uh, what I'm gonna share with you today. So uh, very quickly, I um, think I'm an entrepreneur. I think that I have creative and analytical thinking and the tech background. I'm pretty sure I have 15 years experience in the, in the startup world in company management and strategy. I did found three startups. I'm active uh, community member, active uh, in a, a advisory boards, uh, helping, helping uh, startups to grow. Mostly focusing now on the fundraising, on the process, on the investor materials, and uh, diving deeper a bit to understand where this experience came from. I right after university, I know that some of you are just a students finished or just a business started as a startup or just thinking to start things. So I've been there. I know exactly what's on your mind. So my experience started right after the university. I was focusing. Uh, on the US market because in the university, I had this chance to be on work and travel. Then I tasted what does the US look like? I really enjoyed it and I wanna get back to the US. So I started to do my first uh, venture. Uh, so it was the 3D stuff, etc., cetera, et cetera. Uh, That's how the US experience uh, started, the network started and so on and so on. So uh, overall, I had three companies there. Some went up, some went down. My last experience with a, with a, a software company, uh, it was really, really interesting venture. We got uh, as the most user-friendly CRM on the market, two years in a row gold. We went in the Gardner's Quadrant with such companies like uh, Salesforce, the HubSpot, the Pipedrive, it's a global brand. And here's my company, the Tinget. So it was super interesting venture for, for me to learn a lot of things as a founder and entrepreneur how to build a company, how to scale, how to grow and so on. So this experience, uh, uh, I know how it looks like from founder's perspective. So my passion is to turn ideas into products. So I know basically how to, from idea to go into something that is working, that can be validated and so on. My learnings from this venture, uh, it's a rat race. I know that there's a bubble that uh, uh, startup is a super interesting, super nice world and so on, but there is a lot of dirty things as well in this, in the inside the company, outside the company, on the uh, raising the capital thing, on the competition world, on the marketing, on the sales. So you need to be ready. That's a rat race. Uh, I believe that sharing is a new learning. So that's why I'm today sharing my experience, my personal experience. You can take on what's good for you. Uh, my gift and course is the numbers. So basically I see many things in the numbers. So sometimes it's helping, sometimes it's not just Simply now, even in this, we are 14 participants. I saw that we are five female, five men. Why I saw it, I don't know, but you know, just for you to give to the notice that I'm seeing this. Quickly, uh, what I'm doing here with the wise guys, I'm working with the 200 hour investments. It's a lot. It's uh, the most uh, biggest VC portfolio in the region, a lot of work. So we're seeing a lot of joy grow as a lot uh, of tear, uh, get downs, uh, you know, uh, burnouts, how the founders are getting up, et cetera, et cetera. So this is an enormous experience as well for, for us. Uh, my field, as I said, is a fundraising, extra mile, I'm doing some mentorship. Um, usually I'm the founder's ambassador, meaning I'm trying, trying to, to be always close to the founders. Deep in heart, I'm an uh, entrepreneur myself. And, uh, and yes, so this is me, and I really want to talk about you. It's shame I don't see you, but it's a new reality, and uh, I'm really missing this, this uh, good uh, times when I could talk directly to you guys, but there are a few important things about it. You all are different. The maturity is different. The stage is different. The traction is different. The funding is different. The understanding and knowledge is different. The experience is different. Goals are different. And most important, even the ambitions are different. And it's okay. It should be like this. But it's one thing that we all have equal. It's the time, not the timing. So the time. And we will get back to this. 
So let me share you some important numbers. This is the global statistics. Why do startups fail? So we can see a lot of numbers here, but let's quick, quickly review. So lack of business model, poor marketing, uh, poor customer success. It means that you don't show too much attention to your customer. Lose of the focus, no chemistry between the founders, the team and so on. Lack of passion, right? Poor product, unit economics didn't work. It means you were selling too high, the customers were uh, too, too, acquisition was uh, too high, et cetera, et cetera. And here are three main uh, reasons. Uh, it's that not the right time, not the right team, sorry. Then run out, of, uh, run out of cash, meaning you don't have enough capital and no market need. So what does it mean, no market need? We can say that's not a right time maybe for this, but that's the reality, no market need. And let me quickly show you why do startups succeed? That was well, super good review. And it was about 200 top startups in the world uh, analyzed by success factor. And top four are the funding, the business model, the idea, the execution, meaning the team, the experience about this. And this, the 42% of the success is timing. So it's so important to understand that the timing is so critical for your startup success. If you have something in your head at the moment and it's a super good timing, you need to execute that. You need to do whatever it takes to use this timing. And it's a super important about this. So let me quickly overview this startup development phases in this very, let me say, simple schematic view. So this is the time, the time that typically benchmark from founding to listing. Founding meaning that something appears in your head and you're starting to act. And this is years. Typically, typically it's taking about 12 years of your life to build something that is super valuable, super expensive, that costs billions and it's the uh, global benchmark. And this is, as you see, it's the minus two, minus one and zero point. From the day that something appears in your head that you want to do something about your idea, about your, something that goes to a business, it's taking up to three years. And it's normal that you cannot sleep at night. You wanna do something and you cannot. You don't have team, you don't know where to start. You don't have to, how to build the product, et cetera, et cetera. And for that, you need some time, but you're losing the timing. So in this ideation stage, uh, when you're thinking, how big is the market? Uh, what could be your potential customer? And you're founding someone in your venture, some co-founder, but there is no such commitment. Just let's think together about this. Then after one year, you're thinking, okay, it's called the vision and mission. In the beginning, you don't call it, but why we're doing this? What do we wanna achieve? What we're gonna change? How are we gonna earn the money? And it's becoming some light commitment in the team. Then there is the zero point, typically when the first capital is coming in, even the small tickets from angels or accelerators, but it's the real commitment start. When the agreement start, the founder agreement, the investment agreement, the first traction, this MVP, what Farid was told about you, the minimum viable product. And this is the zero point. You know, sometimes founders celebrate the first investment and it's good, but basically it's a zero point where the real hard work is started. And the next nine years, yes, nine years typically by benchmark, had three scenarios here. The one scenario is this super successful and it's a, uh, you know, the very small percentage that you can achieve this listing, a billion worth company uh, or a few hundred millions in a, a company and going in a very, very successful way. But it's a very rare scenario, but it's achievable. And we can see more and more startups can go this way in this stage. Then there is the middle scenario. And me personally is a big fan of this middle scenario where you can 
grow something big in a hundred million words in the company, and you can go after MA merger acquisition or exit as a founder, sell the company, have some good real profits, the hard work pay off, and so on. When you think about this, 12 years that can be in your, let me say, the best years of your life when you have most energetic, most, you know, passionate about this. And it could be a really tough venture, a really tough journey. And not everyone can go back to this journey. So this 12 years should pay off, you know? So you need to think about these scenarios and to talk loud about this. And definitely a third scenario is the failure, the most common thing in a startup world. And it's okay to talk about this. It's okay to fail. It's okay not to be afraid about this and uh, to discuss. You need to know how to fail fast. You need to know how to fail in a good way so you can stand up, learn from your mistakes and do another venture. So this is those three directions that roughly can be thought about. And this table for you to understand how do the numbers in those nine years could look alike, I would say from a uh, fundraising perspective, but not necessarily. So it's the super hot uh, source from Index Venture, most known uh, venture capital firm in Europe, just last week published. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it shows the real, real benchmark. So this is, uh, these are the years. And in the first year, it's okay you don't have the revenue after first uh, angel or accelerator, uh, just you know, small revenue like 10K, 20K traction, basically it's a zero. You're talking about like three people then. In the year one, we're talking still about pre-traction, but you entering into a seed stage. So we're talking about six people in the company. And the third year is the first important step in your venture, when you need to reach 600,000 in annual recurring revenue. It means about 50,000 in the recurring revenue. At this example, I'm talking more about software as a service subscription in a B2B model, but it's same uh, elementary about the marketplaces or B2C idea, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But it's so important to understand those numbers when you're going with the funding, when you're going how, how much capital it needs to be raised and what's achieved, what percentage of growth, how many people in your team, et cetera, et cetera. Why I'm showing you and why I'm doing you, because this is the part of each startup venture it's absolutely about the numbers. It's absolutely about the calculation, precise calculation in every step and so on and so on. So by going this venture, you as a founder, as a startupper, as a future entrepreneur need to manage this kind of knowledge. So foundation, what is the startup? It's a very simple question. What is the startup? You know. You can find something on Google by explaining what is startup. It's just company starting with some ideas. But if I ask you, you know, from one perspective, like eight years, Uber, 80 billion in uh, in valuation company, is it still a startup? What would be your answer, right? And you would say, oh, no, eight years, no, or five years. And why it's important? Because, you know, when it comes to like funding in some countries, uh, governments have description, what is the startup? And they are giving some grants, et cetera, et cetera. And when you don't know some explanation about the maturity, about the mindset, about the approach, what is the startup? It's missing the foundation and you can skip important things. Then the principle, the founder structure, the founder's commitment, the understanding of founders agreement proposed and why it's important when you're starting something together to, to become a founder's agreement. The business model canvas, yes, in a very early stages, the elevator pitch, the real elevator pitch, what it is and what's the purpose of it. Then it goes to formation, you know, let's open the business. But what does it mean? How to build a company, uh, how the equity stocks, shares, investing are working how the cap table is working and why it's important. 
what is the roles in the company? What is the roles for the CEO? What is the roles for the founder? What is the role for the CTO? How to manage the business accessories like the, 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 the website, the infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. Then it goes to planning always about the planning with the startup, the business strategy and goals, the operational plan and resources, the product vision, the sales and marketing plan, the team management plan, business uh, budget, financial plan, exit plan. Even in the early days, you need to give some, some thoughts. So who when they can acquire you, who when they buy you, that's how the real exit starts planning. Uh, so the product as well. Product planning, product management, product development, product testing, product pricing, product localization, scaling, spin-offing, et cetera, et cetera. So many topics. And once again, I'm talking about these knowledges that needs to be known by a founders, not like by a role, the CTO needs to know. Even the founder needs to know if he has CEO, uh, CMO or uh, other position. The marketing, the marketing strategies, objectives, the marketing tactics, the inbound, outbound. What is the obtainable uh, market? How the unfair advantages are working? What is the ideal customer profile? How to measure this? How the unit economic is working? So that's why I'm showing that table before that everything is about the numbers. Another slide, they're, they're not gonna be a third slide, but another slide. Sales and customer success, a huge topic. The sales is the key fuel to startup success. How you can manage the sales? What are going to be the strategy of the sales? The tactics of the sales? Uh, are you going to go into a global business or are you going to go into multi-local business, meaning entering in each country? The sales culture, the sales motivation, compensation, execution. Then it goes to a very important part, how to build a super team, how to build a core team, what kind of culture you want to have in your company, the roles, the duties, the hiring, uh, collaboration and communication, how you communicate in between, what does it mean to be a CEO in the company, right? The business management, the finance management, stakeholders management, team management, and of course, two, some important topics as well, the funding how to fund your business. It's not necessary venture capital. Maybe it's a crowdfunding, right? Maybe you can go after some government money or maybe you can go, you know, some, some syndicates. Then how you fundraise, the tactics about this, uh, the cap table, how to manage it, uh, how to determine valuation of your company in each stage, the investor relationships, the pitch deck, the investor deck, the terms of the uh, investment agreement, the term sheet and then of course the legal part the most boring part in the startup venture you know the intellectual property the founders agreement service agreement m and a agreements etc 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 how the how the formalities work the, you cannot skip the legal part so remember the time you know you know that timing is very important and here comes the knowledge. I put you somewhere in between just to show you this visualized part. And when you put everything by time, what kind of knowledge you need to operate and to know in each stage of a startup by going in this year. So it's getting crowded, right? So it, it's getting darker because you need to operate this knowledge and you don't know that. So it's getting darker and darker because it's getting very, very, you know, specific in each uh, part. And when you're trying, you know, to see some light in this crowded knowledge map, the legal will come, you know, <laughs> and it will, will, will hide everything. So this is very important, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of uh, just visual part, but this is the most common part where founders get burnout they get so much flooded with their knowledge because you don't know what you don't know. You're just meeting this in every step of your startup and you're getting flooded by this data. So what to do? What is that answer you know, to a key question when it comes to time, timing and knowledge dilemma? How not to lose 
timing when we have same time and we don't have this knowledge. So I'm asking you, as a founder, as a CEO, should you become a master of each position that we just talked? It's a super important question and it's very important to understand that no, but you should become an expert of each position. Look where you're spending your time mostly, then fire yourself from that position. Fire yourself, meaning that you're hiring someone in that position. So this is, this is so important part to understand that don't try to become a master. Don't try to become a super good in something. But you always need to understand how it's working, why it's working, and just to hire someone in that, in that part. Uh, focus what matters now. Do not try to go a few steps forward and to cover your brain with something that you don't need in the moment. Do it step by step. Do it smart. Do it fast. If you need in the particular stage to get, let's say, fundraising, just simply, even in the red stage, launch the product, focus on small traction, focus on the fundraising, build, build a core team. You prioritize what is important, three part. If you are two co-founders, super good. You're talking together, you're splitting this and not just discussing, I'm the CTO, I'm focusing on the product. No, if you are CTO and you are co-founder, if you CEO and you're co-founder, you're both co-founders, you're equal, doesn't matter about the cable, but it equals how you share the knowledge. So it's super important to discuss that. Dream big from a day one. It sounds like a cliche, but believe me, 100 million worst company in the Baltics is no more ambitions anymore. 500 million worth in valuation in Europe is no ambitions anymore. Even becoming a unicorn, a billion worth company in the US is not ambitious anymore. You need to become a decacorn. So, and you ask why? It's very simple. It's not like because the investors become greedy and they want more. Because startups to reach this level needs more and more money. More and more startups becoming, as more and more capital becoming in the world around the startup ecosystem. And because of this competition bubble and everything around this ecosystem, more capital needs to start up to, to build. That's why when the startup needs such capital, for example, in the, in the Series B, someone is coming and give you uh, 50 million. You cannot talk about valuation 100 million. No, you need to talk about at least 300 or 500 million to, to talk about some return for those investors. The same is in the early stage. When you're taking from someone, some angel, you know, uh, 30,000 or 50,000 ticket, and you, your ambition is to build a company for, a, I don't know, maximum uh, 5 million, it's not ambitious. You know, you need to think this uh, way, way bigger. And it helps you to think and to test how big is your idea. Solve the founder's dilemma. It's super important to understand, are you going after the money? Are you going to run the show and being the king? So it's there is no in the middle. And uh, it's a super good read uh, by Business Insider. There's uh, the link, uh, probably, probably Lina will share this. Uh, just three pages to read about this. It's very good to understand what you want to do with your company. You want to be a king as a founder, do everything alone. Everyone is respecting you, doing you know very super good uh, shows, or you're going after the cash. You are very, very strict how you're going to do there and earn the money. I really like those two examples from my experience, from my industry, the, the Mark Benef. Um, I'm pretty sure that some of you know him. The, he's the founder and CEO of uh, Salesforce. I think the number one company in the world uh, on a SaaS business, the pioneers who started this, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, he's a super king uh, in what he's doing. And there is the Radha Bambu. Um, she's the one of the most richest in top five in India. She's a billionaire. And she's also the co-founder of a CRM called Zoho. And uh, she's still uh, the majority shareholder and she's working in customer success. Uh, simply like that, you know, uh, rich. 
in a category range. You know, but it's super interesting example. So when you're going with some your vertical about the business, thinking what to do, try to find some examples and to think and to talk with your co-founder what exactly you want to do. Align your vision and goals. Once again, could sound like a cliche, but understand your role as a founder, it's super important. Once again, understand your role as a founder, not as employee. Forget those what you're doing roles in the company, in the positions, etc. If you are the founder, you have completely different roles here. Uh, yes, as well, draw a restaurant. This exercise first I met uh, when I was fundraising from really nice uh, VC uh, with my third startup. It was a due diligence process when the VC is doing big homework about the business, about the, the competition, and of course, about the founders. So we were three co-founders. They, they bring us in the office, put us in a, a different corners, gave us a white paper, the pencil, and ask, draw a restaurant, how it would look like if it would be your company in five years. So, you know, I'm always dreamed about the US. I draw a restaurant on the West Coast, uh, on a beach, uh, meeting people, fancy food, seafood, you know, uh, expensive, et cetera, et cetera. My co-founder, the CTO guy, draw a completely self-service. No people included in this. So, and it was, you know, it was so strange. I worked with those guys like five years. Ago. We didn't work, uh, we didn't talk about our future. How do we see it? And it was an orange flag for the VC. How the hell you didn't talk about where you're going, you know? So that's why, that's why it's super important with you as a co-founder to talk about this. Write down your vision, your mission, where you're going. It's not a, something that, you know, should come like after three years to become a Coca-Cola. No. Why you as a founder is going there? Why it's important for you, first of all. Then it's going to be on the company. Then it's going to be talked with the people and always uh, reminding that. And even for yourself, remind why I'm going here. And write down all the scenarios. What happens if you fail? It's not the CEO's role if you fail. Just legal to close the company. In the founder's role, both. How you do? What are you going to do with the debt if there will be? How you fire the people? How you communicate this? If you talk it out, those, uh, let's say, failure scenarios, uh, it will be easier to meet them and it will be easier to prepare and probably to avoid because you talk it out. If you always avoid this kind of topic because no, it's a scary topic to fail, so uh, you're running out. And when it comes, it's always gets to some splitting the team, et cetera, et cetera. So don't, don't be afraid and talk about successful scenarios. You would be very surprised that Many, many founders get splitting when the success is starting because they're starting to share something that they do not yet get, but they see this. I don't have enough shares, et cetera, et cetera. Talk it out. Uh, yes, involve your team as more as you can. Um, the core team uh, that someone is bringing in. When you're growing as a company, your core team should be the part. When you are two co-founders, three co-founders, uh, it's okay to discuss it in-house on the decision-making. When you are 50 people, there should be around 10, 12 people as a core team. It's always should be that you can align on, that you can go on some, uh, not like vacation, but if it's go a fundraising, you as a co-founder is going to be traveling, etc. Someone needs to run the business. So when it comes to a 200 people, it's a 30, 35 people as a core team. Involve your team, build the core team. Be proactive. That's very important. That, that you are here, it's super good. Brilliant minds around you, different experiences, ask for the help. If someone asks you, share your knowledge. As I said, you know, sharing is a new learning. So by sharing this, it's a quick to get this. Become a real part of the community around you. You know, go to LinkedIn, connect, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. We have a really, really glowing and growing ecosystem in this region. So be a part of this community. Don't be afraid if you don't have the knowledge. Get the knowledge now. And last but not least, so what the startup ABC stands for? So always be closing. That's the word from a movies, legendary, from a books and so on. It's always about the sales. It's always about the sales. 
whatever role in your company, you're selling your company. You are ambassador of your company, selling, selling, selling. Always be creating. Do not stand in one point. Think what is around you. Be creative. Uh, try to build something new. Try to think. Try, try to uh, implement new things. Try to hack new things. Be creative. When it comes to real competition, you will see how the competitors are, are creative. So you need to put your mindset about this. Always be caring about yourself, about your health, about around you, about your people. Always be caring. It's really, really important. Always bring cash. It's about the investment. Once you're fundraising, you're always fundraising. It never ends. So it's a big decision. If you're going after the capital, you're going after the capital. You just close the round next day, in, you celebrate in the evening, next morning you're fundraising again. So that's how it's working. That's the game of the rules, rules of the game. Absolute best crew. Yes, you are the best and always be the best. And think, I'm the best, whatever it takes to be the best. Always better control. Improve your management skills, improve your financial skills, improve your team building skills, improve your hiring skills, improve your firing skills. Control, it's what you need to really, really become good uh, founders. Always be careful. As I said, it's a rat race. There is a lot of dirty games in the competitor's way, in the marketing way, you know, in the, in the fundraising way. Always, you know, try to, to see what's, what's going on. Always be challenging yourself, your environment, your mentors, your, your, your people, your founder, even yourself. Why are you doing this? You know, always be challenging. And if you think that it's, uh, it's not true, it's nothing, and then, then you don't believe this, so you can be another bullshit company. So it's always good to go this direction as well, you know? So yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, uh, we can connect on LinkedIn and become uh, the part of our ecosystem. I'm, I'm really inviting you to do this. Uh, thank you. Um, I think maybe we have a question. If there are any questions, please do ask, guys. There's uh, five more minutes where we can uh, manage some questions to come in. So uh, Marina is asking if um, if she's the best, let's take an account, but what if she prefers to bring to her team better and wiser people? Is that a good approach in terms of building the team? It's always a good approach to build, uh, to bring the wiser people they knew. It's the fastest way to learn. It's uh, the fastest way to, to grow together. So, you know, all the best leaders are always talking about this, the bring the smarter people they knew. Otherwise, you spend a lot of time of coaching people, uh, preparing for you and so on, instead of growing yourself. So my advice would be always bring the smarter people than you. Okay. Any other questions, guys? No pressure now. As I said, you know, you can connect. <laughs> you can connect anytime on LinkedIn and give me the message if you have some, some questions as well. Uh, Kata is asking where to find smarter people. <laughs> That's a hard one, <laughs> I guess. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's always being in the middle of somewhere, you know, being, uh, uh, it's not like a joke to being the part of the ecosystem. We, we do have a really good ecosystem around us. It's, it's super growing. I, I, I do see myself like from the last seven years, it's amazingly changed. We have super interesting startup that uh, the founders and the people from the super good startups that go going uh, outside, they uh, want to do build something, they have experience and so on. So being in the ecosystem, being in the middle, participating in the events, participating around, even in this, in this situation when we have the COVID, participating online, you can meet really smart people. Yeah. Okay, and there's another question about, um, while founding, um, while founding a company, I think there's a question about your experience. Did you have your coach or mentor? Did you have a coach or a mentor while you were funding, founding your company? Uh, yes, I, I, I showed this in the first slide. Um, I was very lucky. I, I got my first mentor in the United States, the Dan McKenzie, the very successful entrepreneur. I think the one of the best I know. And uh, 
he became my men mentor when I was like 23. And uh, after that, he was mentoring uh, not only about the business, the life, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and we become a good friends even now. So I do advise you if you have this chance to find some some good mentors, uh, please do it. It's a, it's a good point. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, and then another question. I'm not sure what time it came in because I think under uh, time zone is slightly skewed. Um, are dual class shares possible um, or common in the EU companies without incorporating in US? Can you read the question? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know why why <laughs> this question is here. It's a more like legal question. So I do not know the answer yet now to this question. Yeah, that's what I was saying. I'm not sure at what point it came in. Maybe it came in during the presentation at some point where it made more sense. Um, but as the time is a bit, a bit skewed. Yeah, that's okay. why you always need someone you know to advise on different things, including the legal and financial. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have a legal commentator uh, on the side next time. Um, yeah. Okay. If there are no any questions uh, coming in, I'm going to thank you, Marius, for today's presentation. Uh, sure. Thank you for sharing, sharing all of this. Um, as Marius said, if you want to connect, he shared all the details. Um, and we will also share all the details that we have regarding this presentation, uh, the recording for anyone who didn't manage to jump in into this uh, live session. And a part of that, as I said in the beginning, please um, be aware of the emails that will be coming uh, in the upcoming days regarding the office hours and all the extra info regarding um, regarding the future. Wait, wait fundraising stage from yours. Oh, there was uh, another question about what's the biggest challenge in the fundraising stage from your experience? I think uh, it, it, it very depends. Uh, like even, you know, from <laughs> from Andres about about experience uh, from, from the region, like from, from example, if you, if you fundraise from, from uh, Europe to, to the US, uh, typically it's uh, when it comes to a uh, uh, time time frame, it, it can take up to eighteen months, depending from the first step, of networking, and the legal stuff, flipping, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's very, 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 very depends on a uh, way where you fundraising. If it's like pre-seed, it's a one stage; it's seed, it's another stage. From the benchmarking part, you know, it's uh, the most difficult uh, rounds are uh, exactly pre-seed and Series B. But from my personal experience. Uh, from my most challenging part was uh, the seed, not the series A and not the pre-seed. So it's uh, probably it probably depends. So it's it's always about the math, the traction, the the, the what you're doing, and etc. In this region, in this region, we do have a bit more challenging parts, the like cap table, because the previous founders are bringing investors from the corps, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and we know a lot of startups. Uh, in the ecosystem, they meeting this challenge. So, and this matters really to to solve this in the beginning. Good. Yeah, I think the the yeah, the interesting part is to understand um, the differences between our region, maybe kind of trying to benefit from this region's <laughs> uh, funding rounds, and then other regions, and kind of grasping the benefits of all of it. Uh, so that's an interesting question, actually. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, if this is the last question, then I'm going to say uh, thank you to you, Marius. Thank you to all the participants uh, for joining us today. And we will see all of you um, in two weeks in the next one. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. So